Welcome to Blink on 15. I'm Tab Atkins Bittner, TAB for short, and you might know me from my work on standards, CSS specifically. Uh, if you don't, let's grab a drink sometime. I'd like to chat about stuff. First of all, I'd like to say this is the most well attended birthday party I've ever had. Thank you all for showing up. Presents can be left at the table in the foyer. If you're not here for my birthday, but instead to listen to a lot of very interesting talks from your fellow engineers, that's fine. I'll consider that my gift to you. Let's go over some quick announcements. First, you might note that this year's uh, BlinkCon is a little bit shorter than previously. We have two days of three hours of programming each. Over the past year and a half or so of uh, quarantines and lockdowns, we've all just really succumbed to screen fatigue. Listening to a tiny person talk in a rectangle for several hours at you, isn't sustainable, more exhausting than anyone could imagine. So we're trying to keep this one short and sweet. Uh, hopefully this will make it a little more enjoyable, a little more uh, uh, standable throughout the course of it until we can finally transition back to in-person or hybrid meetings in the future. So the day one schedule can be found at the event reception page that should be available, uh, should be accessible from Hopin. Uh, if it's not, or if you can't find it, it's also on the chromium.org page for Blink on 15. There's a networking feature we're trying out in Hopin uh, right now. It's kind of interesting. You go into it, it automatically matches you up with a random person for just a couple minutes of chatting before cutting you off, before it can get awkward and shifting you off to somebody new. Uh, should be running throughout the day, and we'll also be having it open for an hour after the meeting uh, if you want to just try it out and meet some of your fellow attendees. We'll be doing the same thing tomorrow. In particular, we'll start an hour before the event at 8 a.m. Pacific. Recordings for the day will be available on the Hopin platform shortly after and the YouTube, uh, our, our normal Blink uh, YouTube channel, uh, tomorrow the day after, sometime very shortly. Uh, today's agenda is pretty straightforward. In just a few moments, we'll be going to the keynote done by Nicole Sullivan and Chris Harrelson. After that, we'll have about 40 minutes of lightning talks hosted by our very own Kentaro, and then an hour and a half of sessions run by 30-minute uh, pieces run by a number of our uh, engineers to talk over various interesting topics. We'll be running two at a time, so you have to decide which one you want to attend. Feel free to hop in and out of them as you find one more interesting of the other. We can't tell. Uh, and then finally, at the end, we'll have a social event with Jake and Surma, who you probably already know. If not, it will be a great time. It'll be run over Meet separately from the Hopin. Um, we'll have the links up for that uh, when it's time. Or if you're following along the official slide deck, you can just click on the link there. So without any further ado, the keynote presentation for BlinkCon 15. Welcome to the stage, Nicole and Chris. Hi, thanks for having us here today. Um, we're really excited to talk to you. I'm Nicole Sullivan, the web UI PM for Chrome. And I'm Chris Harrelson, Eng lead for rendering and an API owner. Today, we'd like to focus on sustainability. Let's start out with what we mean by that. Chris and I both really care about sustainability in the environment, but sometimes we find it hard to know what to do differently or which trade-offs to make. Next slide. We're excited that sustainability is the theme of BlinkCon 15 so that we can all take a moment to pause and reflect on sustainable environments and sustainable communities. A lot's happening right now ecologically. The UN Climate Change Conference just happened and lots of regions are experiencing the effects of climate change. I was pretty shocked when my son said his birthday is during fire season. Next slide, please. Uh, here you see San Francisco's Mars Day. Next slide, please. Business travel can be useful and fun, but it's also a drag on the environment. It represents at least 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. We think that Blinkon should do its part to reduce this number, while at the same time preserving and even enhancing inclusiveness. If we don't fix this, Blink will not be sustainable in the long term. But how can we achieve that? Next slide, please. Here's one way we can help. I'm excited to announce that BlinkOn will be hybrid going forward. This means you'll easily be able to attend in person and also virtually, 
whichever works best for you. That sounds great. This can reduce that 2% a little bit. It's also important for diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's clear that a more diverse project are more successful and not everyone can attend in person. A hybrid blink on also saves time and improves work-life balance. Spending more time with my family and less time going from place to place is a win for me. Even if I love attending face-to-face, -face, there'll be times when I can't. Next slide, please. Sustainability also means that our project is healthy and working for everyone. It's clear that we all benefit from working together. So we really want to make this place, this project, a welcoming place for all. As you can see, people are attending BlinkCon from all over the world. It's great to see people coming together from so many different countries. An important part of a sustainable community is communication and transparency in decision making. To that end, we've made chromestatus.com more accurate. We've added transparency to the API owner decision making process, and we're continuing to do that iteratively over time. We're writing more web.dev and developer.chrome.com articles. Next, we'll be updating our code ownership guidelines. So look out for that. I'm also happy that we continue to increase diversity in code and API ownership. There are several non-Google API owners, and I hope we can increase that in the future. And on that note, please consider self-nominating to be an API owner. And now, in the grand tradition of BlinkOn, here are some fun stats about the code base. Here is the distribution of non-Google commits from Chromium and some of its component open source projects since last BlinkOn. As you can see, more than 27% are individuals using an account domain not clearly associated with an organization. There are a lot of companies and organizations driving the web forward with us too. In particular, I want to call out Agalia, who enables organizations who don't have browser teams to commit to the Chromium project. Overall, there have been 205 intents to prototype, experiment, or ship since the last BlinkOn. That's more than one per calendar day since that event. And 89 of those have been intents to ship. Wow, that's great. High charts and stats are fun, but don't really tell the whole story. Now let's dig in to see what cool stuff everyone has been building. So let's dig into those individual contributors. Um, what we notice is these are folks who aren't associated with an organization, and yet they're doing amazing work to commit to the Chromium code base. Uh, we'd love to highlight three of them. Andrew Botella, who implemented the Structured Clone API. Great work, Andrew. 135 thumbs up and no thumbs down. That may be an HTML spec record. Timothy Gu, who improved URL parsing interoperability, fixing more than 400 web platform tests. And Cheng Zhu Wu, who fixed long-standing interoperability issues in typed array and added a great new feature to array. Egalia contributed tremendously to the web in the last six months and to Chromium as well. I'm a math fan myself, so super excited for an interoperable math ML on the web. But they also contributed a lot to the MPArch architectural project, added some really nice CSS features like scroll bar gutter and highlight pseudo classes, improved accessibility, helped with Wayland and Lacrosse, and added public and private class fields to V8. That's incredible. Microsoft is doing amazing work too. This includes JSON and CSS modules, the virtual keyboard eyedropper API, and GridNG. And they have two new core Blink owners since the last time. Welcome and congratulations. Indeed. Facebook specified, implemented, and shipped a JavaScript self-profiling API. With this API, developers can collect profiling traces from the wild from real users to find and fix bottlenecks. ByteDance is a newer contributor to the community. Welcome. Thanks for the great work to improve the code health comments for features such as base colon colon value and for your help making desktop PWAs better. We wish we had time to go through every commit. You've all done such great work. But we thank you, and we'd like to talk about some additional features that have been shipped. Let's take a closer look at other things that have happened in the Chromium code base to move the web forward. First up, user interfaces. The shared element transitions API is on an amazing arc. Just this spring, it wasn't even a prototype. Now we have an origin trial with lots of excitement from partners and strong progress on a spec. 
These are real demos using the API and origin trial. Tokopedia enabled it on their site under the trial as well. Accent color allows customization of highlight colors for form controls like checkbox and radio. Developers are excited to not be stuck with Chromium Blue. Looks like it'll soon be in all browser engines also. Color V1 provides vector graphics as font glyphs. The format is tightly integrated with the open type font format and provides higher rendering fidelity over bitmaps for emoji and icon fonts. The rendering quality improvement from this feature is achieved at about a fifth of the file size, making downloadable emoji fonts viable on the web for the first time. Composite After Paint has shipped. Yes, that's right. You heard it right. It has shipped. We've been talking about this one at several Blinkons over the years. My first Blinkon presentation on this topic was in Sydney about five years ago. Amazing. Congratulations to the team. Container queries is consistently the number one feature requested in CSS, and we're close to delivering it. By the way, the number 2, 3, 6, 8, 10, and 12 are also being implemented now or very soon in Chromium by both Google, Agalia, and Microsoft. Canvas now has a batch of really useful new features, including context loss, reset, and filters and gradients. Even better, out of process Canvas raster has impressively improved performance and stability. Web codecs ship too. On the left is an animated image, and on the right, the code that implements the animation frames. So simple. Zoom is using this feature to improve performance. DevTools has several new UI features also. They've added tooling support for container queries and support for debugging full user flows in DevTools plus Lighthouse, as well as support for privacy sandbox features. Next up, let's dig into our improvements to navigation and loading. VF Cache shipped on desktop. Sorry, it's a mobile demo, but it was on desktop. Has a hit rate of 30% and now has DevTools support. I love seeing that demo. It really makes a difference. Um, it's also neat to see how pre-rendering and pre-fetching speed up the user experience. We're steadily getting rid of the blank white screen. Web Transport has also shipped. It's a new method of low latency server communication, including support for unreliable and unordered channels. This closes a long-standing feature gap on the web for applications that need those features. Next up, let's check in on user experience stats and progress. Thanks to developers around the world working hard on improving their sites, the ecosystem as a whole is steadily improving its performance. 20% more page visits in Chrome now fully meet the recommended Core Web Vitals thresholds. And the total percentage of page visits in Chrome that meet those thresholds is now 60%, which is a big deal. Much of these advancements are a direct result of the work being done by developer communities. Including the improvements that many content management systems, website builders, and e-commerce platforms have made. You can see that many are sharply up and to the right, with some showing more than a 200% improvement year on year and leaders like Duda and Jimdo surpassing 50% of origins with good Core Web Vitals scores. Chrome teams have also worked with some popular JavaScript frameworks, including Next.js and Angular, to deliver the best user experiences possible without sacrificing developer experience. This is amazing progress. Web, permissions per web permission predictions uses machine learning to infer whether permissions prompt is relevant for the user. For prompts that are below a certain threshold, a quieter version of the permission prompt is shown. Now, how about the ecosystem in our code architecture? That'll be next. Web developers struggle a lot with differences between browsers, even in existing features. Based on developer feedback from surveys and bugs, we identified five focus areas for 2021 and a set of tests that make up the Compat 2021 metric. The metric scores have improved for all browsers over the course of the year to above 90%. All three browser engines are now working together to, together to define the next iteration of this effort, effort, which will be called Interop 2022. I love it when we can all work together. Chrome Status Now has a roadmap page that allows you to scroll through the feature timeline. Uh, log in, and you'll see your own features all in one place. The Web IDL spec now has a home at the What WG after such a long time living on a private repo. And Bike Shed has a way to refer directly to web platform tests for each section of a spec. 
This one is huge. Rendering NG is done. What an achievement, eight years in the making. It unlocks so many great features like container queries. To learn more, check out the blog posts on developer.chrome.com. Partition Alloc is a new memory allocator for Blink that is almost done shipping on all platforms. Check out the graph showing memory use down into the right. Fun facts, AppCache has been around since 2008. It's time to retire it in favor of a newer service worker-based approach. It's been unshipped. The V8 team continues to turn out impressive optimizations. The Spark plug, concurrent inlining, and fast API calls projects alone improved Core Web Vital scores across the web and made big strides in Canvas and WebGL batch call performance. Finally, let's review some cool APIs that shipped or are origin trialing recently. The idle detection API shipped. This, help chat, this helps chat apps avoid duplicating notifications on all your devices. I'm looking forward to that one because I've definitely had that issue. Last month, Adobe announced that it's bringing its flagship application Photoshop to the web. Photoshop is built on top of many of the latest web platform capabilities, such as file system access handles, WebAssembly exception handling, and a long list of additional optimizations and features that push the platform to its limits and beyond. Zoom also has a PWA that relies on the web audio and compute pressure APIs. App history fixes a lot of developer pain with the existing history API. It's an origin trial now. The reporting API allows your site to monitor security violations and deprecated APIs. The prioritized task scheduling API lets you specify which tasks are high or low priority to improve web app responsiveness. And last but certainly not least, Secure Payment Confirmation brings secure web authentication authentication to payments on the web. It's shipped recently and we're excited about this step towards low friction, secure web payments. So wow, that's some fast, fantastic work for us to fit into 15 minutes. Um, now it's time to let you enjoy all the sessions ahead. We hope you have a great BlinkCon. Thanks everyone for being here and being part of an awesome community. And thanks again for making Blink sustainable for the long term. Let's all do it together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole and Chris. That was wonderful and very exciting. Coming up next are Lightning Talks hosted by Kentaro. All right, so welcome everyone. So back to the Brincon Lightning Talk session. Are you excited? So as always, so I want to celebrate so Brincon so using the party cracker. So this is a real party cracker, not emoji. So one, two, three. Yay! So Today, uh, we have 13 awesome lightning talks. I asked each speaker to insert one point where they can get a storm of applause. So please find that point and send a round of applause using the text chat. The lightning talk sessions are also watching this session. All right, so let's get started. <laughs> I'm Alex from Megalia. Let me tell you some news about Ozone. This has been a long project already, so let me start with a brief retrospective. Ozone is the abstraction layer that wraps the actual platform and desktop environment on Linux. It was first invented for Chrome OS, and we work on making the desktop Chrome on Linux using Ozone to improve support for numerous variations of Linux that exist in the world. In a few preceding years, we went from the beginning of this work to starting the Finch trial, where non-Ozone and Ozone paths had been tested for parity. The trial started this summer, soon after BlinkCon 14. So, where are we today? In short, the trial went well and ended with positive result. Since M95, which was released in late August, Ozone is on by default on all channels. So now Ozone and Linux are synonyms, and there will be no way back. But that is not the end, because our ultimate goal 
is shipping native support for Wayland. So our next steps are remove the runtime checks for the feature flag that we used in the Finch trial. Eliminate the use X11 macro because the Linux code is not bound to X11 anymore. And finally, go on with the Wayland platform. Actually, we would appreciate help. The Wayland platform is currently almost ready. And if you use Wayland in your daily work, likely you will benefit from using the native support for Wayland in Chrome. Since M97, trying the Wayland version has become easier as never before, because we have added the flag for choosing the preferred platform onto Chrome flags. Feature-wise, the Wayland platform is almost identical to X11. So try it and let us know if you liked it. Unless you use NVIDIA GPU, because it's not yet supported, and rendering is software only. But that should change soon, because NVIDIA is working on Wayland support too, and they have released that support in the beta drivers already. Finally, here is the incomplete list of people who work on Ozone and help with their views. Thank you for your attention. Hi everyone, my name is Kira Sievers, and today I'll be talking to you about how Blink affects storage partitioning in the file system APIs. So storage partitioning is a project where we take web platform APIs used for storage and communication and ensure that they are isolated or partitioned by top-level site in third-party context. And this is in addition to being isolated by the same origin policy. So there are three types of file system API usages. The first is sandbox, which is what you would typically think of a file system. It's per origin and quota managed. Isolated, which exposes files from other types of file systems. And external, which paradoxically is used internally in Chrome OS code. Only sandboxed and parts of the isolated file system interact with the renderer process, so those are the topic of our talk today. So how we pass around the information necessary to then partition storage is through an object called the Blink storage key. And it consists of three parts, the origin, the top level schemeful site, and an optional nonce. There are two important types of storage keys. The first is a first party storage key, which is constructed from a URL in the browser process. And the second is a third party storage key, which is accessed directly from the renderer frame. A guiding question throughout our work was how do we ensure that sandboxed instances or web exposed instances get the proper third party storage key value from the renderer process? A good case study for this is the file system manager and Pepper as part of the legacy file system. As you can see in this comment, Pepper was accessing file system manager through a per renderer thread registration. Now this was bad because you, you can see here in the original code that this did not allow us to access the third party storage key. Rather, we were registering and binding to the renderer thread to access file system manager. So in the after code, you can see we changed it such that we access the renderer frame. So now it's per context. And we then take that renderer frame and then bind the file system manager to the browser interface broker which then from the browser interface broker allows us to get easily the third party storage key for that renderer frame. The takeaway from this case study is that what broker we use in the renderer to browser IPC affects whether we can correctly storage partition. And in this specific case, we needed a frames broker because the third party storage key required information from the third party content being displayed in that frame. So in summary, when we're storage partitioning the file system API, how or if we interact with the Blink renderer determines whether it'll be a first party or third party storage key value. And the type of broker we're using for IPC determines whether we can access the third party storage key at all. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Dom Ferrolino. I'm an engineer on the Chrome team, and I also happen to be one of the editors of the refer policy W3C web standard which is mostly what we'll be talking about today. This talk is basically about refers, refer policies, and how they intersect with the redirects. So the high-level over overview of refers 
um, goes something like this. When you're on a, on a site like a.com and you send something like a script request off to another server, the browser will add a bunch of request headers to this request, one of which is the refer header. The refer header is a request header that's been notoriously spelled wrong since 1996, which is why there's one R in the middle there. And it sends basically the, the current document's URL on any outgoing requests. Um, this is also a privacy leak, even though it's super useful for things like, like marketing promotions and campaigns and server-side statistics collection. It sends a lot of information, potentially sometimes the full URL of the document, to outgoing requests, which can leak some sensitive information to the servers. In order to mitigate the leakiness of the refer header, the web platform developed the refer policy response header that documents can be served with to instruct the browser how much exactly of the document's URL should be leaked on outgoing requests. We can see it in action here when a document on a.com is served with this header um, and has the same origin refer policy directive applied to it. Requests outgoing to, for example, b.com um, take into, consider, cons into consideration the refer policy header um, when computing the refer header that goes in the request. In this case, the browser will inspect both origins involved, determine that they are cross-origin, and therefore we cannot uh, include any refer header on this request. Okay, we made it this far. So how do redirects interact with refers? Well, there's a common misconception that I see people have on the web platform uh, that is the, the site that is used to compute the refer header actually changes on redirects. However, this is not really true. So there's two things to keep in mind when it comes to redirects and refers. Uh, number one, the site that's actually used to compute the content of the refer header never changes. And number two, the refer policy response header on any redirects is indeed honored. So let's see how this plays out in a few examples. Here's a document on a.com that will always send a refer header. And note on request to b.com, the refer header indeed exists and is intact. If b.com were to redirect to c.com, for example, note that the refer information sent in the header is a.com, not b.com. Here's another example where a.com will always send a refer. And on a request to b.com, as expected, it's intact. But b.com is, is a redirect served with the same origin re refer policy, which is a tighter policy. And so if it redirects to c.com, we actually remove the refer header altogether. Here's a different example where a.com has a refer policy that results in no refer header to b. But b.com might want to actually expose a.com as the refer on its redirect. So it'll serve itself with the unsafe URL refer policy, which basically means perform no redaction. But the problem is, refer redaction is a one-way street. Once you lose information, you can never get it back. And so when you provide no redaction on an already redacted string, its redirect also forwards along no information. This is most trivially observed when a.com has the same origin refer policy, requests something from b.com, and therefore doesn't have a refer header, but b.com actually redirects back to a.com. Notice the request is ultimately same origin, but because we lost the refer header somewhere in the redirect chain, we never get it back. And that about covers it, so thanks for watching. Hi everyone, it's Rakina from the Chrome Security Architecture MDF Cache teams. Let me introduce you to the initial empty document and its problems. First of all, what is the initial empty document? I can try to explain it, or I can just show you what it's like. Okay, did you see it? No? Okay, let's see it again on an iframe now. Still can't see it. Okay, the initial empty document is the first document that a frame loads before it commits its first real navigation. Looks just like this, and it's pretty easy to miss it since we load pages pretty fast. Sounds boring, but it's actually important to get it right because it's where every single frame starts and maybe where it ends if it never commits another document. It sounds simple, but there's lots of quirks around it. For example, the did commit IPC for the initial empty document load never gets sent to the browser causing bad side effects like not creating a session history entry for it, which leads to crashes and bugs in code that do not expect that. And it's not just Blink that handles it badly. I wrote some tests for the history behavior and all browsers behave differently. Also, the name initial empty document is actually full of edge cases, starting with document. If you navigate from the initial empty document to another same origin document, the frame will keep the window object, including things like event listeners, but you will get a new document object. This is the only case where that happens and of course cause bugs because people do not expect this. Second, it's not always empty. Its opener can append anything to its body through inner HTML or other ways. But if and only if you modify it through document.open or document.write, it will lose its initial empty document status, even though it's still on the same document object. 
Again, unexpected case, lots of bugs. Finally, initialness. So I lied a little bit. The document that you see on a new frame might not be the initial empty document after all. In some cases, we synchronously commit another about blank document immediately after it. They are two completely different documents, but we thought they were the same thing. Unlike the initial empty document commit, the second commit does get sent to the browser like a normal navigation. This is good because it will create session history entry, but for a while, this fooled us into thinking that the initial empty document commit does get sent to the browser and everything is nice in the world. Unfortunately, the world is not that nice. In some cases, we don't commit the second about blank document and just stay on the initial empty document, so the browser never gets the did commit IPC, and it leads to the problems like we mentioned before. It took us a while to figure this out, and of course, there's also weird bugs related to the synchronous about blank commit, because of course. Okay, that's a lot of problems. Did we fix them? Good question. We are on the way to fixing them. Started around last blink on, still going now, so about two quarters and a few existential crises into it. It was a lot of work because nobody really understands it 100%, lots of docs, discussions, audits, and finally CLs, which I hope by the time this talk is played on BlinkCon, already landed. We are solving a bunch of big old problems with our changes, improving the spec and our implementation. Things are more predictable and documented now, I hope. And big projects like render document and bit commit params removal are unblocked because of this. So I guess it's kind of worth it in the end. Of course, there's still a couple things left to be fixed, but that's a story for another day because I am out of time. As always, thanks to Naviction Dev and goodbye for now. I'm Mason Freed and I wanted to tell you about three new APIs we're trying to bring to the web platform. This all started when we asked developers which form control gives you the most frustration. Developers answered this question overwhelmingly that the select menu is not very fun to work with. If you ask on Stack Overflow, how do I style the select? You'll get a number of questions asked, not very many satisfactory answers, and many questions that were asked over a decade ago. So some of the common select requests that we'd really like to unlock include allowing arbitrary content within options, things like both images and text in one option, the ability to fully style all parts of the control using CSS, and that includes both the in-page control, which is somewhat stylable today, but also the list box control, which pops up, and that's not very stylable today. Simple things should be simple to implement, and complex use cases should also be possible, but in all cases, the control should be accessible by default. One thing that we realized while working on this is that this really is three new web platform primitives and not just one. So there is the select menu itself, but also there's a need on the platform for a pop-up element, something that's always on top, one at a time, and handles the light dismiss behavior, which is that when you move on, you click outside or you hit escape, it closes for you. And the third is that once you have one of these pop-ups, you'd like to be able to position it relative to something else, and that's anchor positioning. Today in Chromium, we have prototypes for the select menu and the pop-up, but we're still working on the API shape for anchor positioning. I thought the best way to use the rest of my time was to show you a few live demos of these elements in Chromium. So first, the select menu. Here you see an example which has already an animated control to be able to open the pop-up. When I click it, I get options that have images next to them for the flags of each country. And if I scroll, it gets positioned appropriately above the control if needed. The HTML for this page is very simple. It's declarative HTML only, no JavaScript. And it's what you'd expect. Each option contains an image and some text, and the rest just works. The next demo is a very simple one for the pop-up. This contains only two lines of HTML, one for a button and one for a pop-up. And the button has a declarative attribute pop-up which points over to the pop-up element. This is all you need to be able to declaratively open the pop-up by clicking the button. The next demo is a more complicated example, just showing more pop-ups, that, showing that you can style them easily, and also that you can nest them to make menus. All of this is handled for you and no JavaScript is needed, including to be able to close the menus when you click outside. And here again, the HTML is very simple, no JavaScript, and fully declarative. I've included some links for interesting other things you can go research about. And I'd really like to thank all the people on this slide for all the work that they've put in, both in the prototypes and in the spec work and in the brainstorming, particularly the Open UI community group where all of the work has been being done. Thank you very much. 
Hi, my name is Stephen. I lead the web payments team in Chrome, and today I'm giving an update on secure payment confirmation. So firstly, in my best carton announcer voice, previously on secure payment confirmation, aka what have you all forgotten since my talk last blink on? Well, firstly, I explained what SPC is. SPC brings WebAuthn to payments on the web, simple, seamless, and secure user authentication in a privacy-preserving way. I talked about a pilot study done by Stripe comparing SPC to traditional SMS OTP challenge flows. The study showed great results, an 8 percentage point increase in conversions, three times faster time to authenticate, and negligible fraud. But it also showed we had work to do in the enrollment site, as only 20% of users enrolled when given the opportunity. And finally, last blink on I shared our future plans, another origin trial, more platforms, more partners, and launch? So, what have we been up to since then? After all, it's only been, what, six months? That's not very long, right? Well, we have been quite busy. We started with the enrollment flow, removing the payment handler requirement and switching to an iframe with browser-mediated UX. But don't get too attached to that UX because we then decided to remove it. After analyzing the user flow, we found it better to let RP shape the enrollment experience and rely on web and dialogues to inform the user of the identity relationship that's being created. We've also made a bunch of API changes, including aligning closer to web often and making the feature more flexible for web developers. And we dealt with some privacy concerns, working hard to make sure that SPC doesn't leak any information without the user's consent. Thanks to awesome work, both by the team and also our two amazing summer interns, Jenny and Hansel, we implemented support for SPC on Android. And a slide that nobody else here cares about but me, we managed to get SPC supported in the 3DS v2.3 specification for credit card payments on the web. Trust me, this is big stuff. And finally, we launched <laughs> in Chrome M95 on Mac and Windows only. Unfortunately, Android was unable to launch on time due to a lack of platform level support for discoverable credentials, but we hope to see it follow in 2022. So we're done, right? Time to pack up our bags and go home. Well, not even close. This is still just the beginning. We're still looking for more partners with Adyen and Airbnb starting a pilot now and hopefully other developers engaging next year. We're still looking to launch more platforms, Android for real this time and Chrome OS. And there's still lots more to iterate on. So what can I say? See you all at BlinkCon 16. Hi, my name is Nina, and I'll be presenting on web button conditional UI, replacing passwords on the web for good, question mark. And that QR code right there is a link to this presentation. So what's the uh, web authentication API? It's an API that lets you use devices to authenticate users in a phishing resistant way, where devices means security keys, your phone or your laptop. And I'm not going to elaborate on why it's phishing resistant. You're going to have to believe me. This API is used widely as a second factor today in many mainstream websites, such as Twitter.com here. This is a screenshot from there. So if you have a device and you want to register it, you can do it. And then we're seeing some websites start using it as a replacement for passwords, like Microsoft here. But there are some problems right now with this approach that we want to fix. And one of them is um, showcased here by, by this screenshot, and it's branding to launch WebAuthn. The button there says sign in with Windows Hello, but in reality, you can also use Touch ID, Android phone, your Chrome OS device, or some future gadget. And there's another problem, which is if you tap that button, but you haven't registered your device yet, then you'll see this horrible modal dialogue that's not very helpful. And the website cannot know in advance that this situation will happen because the website doesn't know who you are. So we fix all of this with something called conditional UI. And the idea is we auto fill web author credentials together with passwords, but only when they exist. That's where the conditional part comes from. Now you no longer have to worry about branding because the browser is doing that for you. And it's only shown if there are credentials. Here's what the code looks like. Uh, on the left, we have the JavaScript that does a vanilla web button request, but then it adds this mediation conditional parameter. And then on the right, there's uh, the markup for the page and those fields that are relevant are tagged with autocomplete equals web button. 
If you want to try it and you have a MacBook, here's a link to a demo. And OK, we fixed passwords. Uh, maybe not quite yet. So we have a few more features coming. One of them is syncing credentials, which should help with recovery and signing in from a new device. And then the other one is a bunch of different signals for websites that help them get some state on the current device and from the users to register new devices. And that's everything I have. So thank you very much and continue enjoying Mincon. Hi, everybody. My name is Zachary Rudu. Uh, welcome to my Blinkon 15 talk. Today, I'm going to be talking about security key signing data management, um, a new feature that's coming to Chrome. So uh, let's start off with some context. Uh, discoverable credentials, they're a relatively new feature of FIDO2 security keys, uh, where a website can actually store the web authentication credentials on the security key internal storage. Newer versions of these keys allow uh, the user to edit uh, their, their user data. So uh, I went ahead and I'm going to go ahead and talk about uh, the new feature, which allows users to, to manage their sign-in data. So here's the current state of um, credential management. You can see the, the website, which the credential belongs to, along with the logo, and the username and display name grouped into one. Uh, the issue with this is that it actually doesn't allow the, the editing of, of credentials, only the deletion. So uh, let's have a look at the, the redesigned version. So right here, uh, the display name and username are actually split out into two different um, se sections to, to, to provide the user clarity of what exactly is being updated. Uh, also, uh, edit button and delete button are, uh, are added on the right side. So let's have a look at uh, how the, uh, the edit flow works. So uh, once you go ahead and click on the edit button, it shows you the uh, edit dialog. So it shows you the display name, um, current display name, along with uh, input box, same thing with the username. It allows you to just input a new display name and a new, new username um, and go ahead and hit save and also, uh, or cancel if you, you want to abort the changes. Uh, also, it gives you a notice that uh, the user data and uh, the username and display name are for display only. And uh, they're still going to sign on to the same account for, uh, for the website of which your, the, the credentials belong to. Uh, this is because we use actually um, the user ID, which is uneditable uh, for uh, for signing into the uh, to the user to the account. Um, so let's have a quick talk about error handling. So um, this this flow allows us to to validate the input if invalid characters are um, are inputted or if the input is too long. Uh, for example, here uh, plus is actually a valid symbol. But just for the sake of example, it was set to invalid. And if you see right here, when the user goes to update uh, and adds a plus, it gives them an error and prompts the user to, to correct it. Some of the technologies used within this project are C++ for, interfa for interfacing between uh, the front end, uh, like the UI, and the authenticator. Um, TypeScript, HTML, CSS, and Polymer were all used on the front end to build the, the UI and make the UI reactive uh, after interacting with the, the C++ code to retrieve credentials, to delete credentials, and to, um, to update them. Uh, Google test was used for uh, running unit tests. And this was very useful because it allows me, it allows you to catch uh, issues early on in the development cycle. And Chrome DevTools are really useful for prototyping the UI without having to recompile Chrome each and every time. Uh, thank you guys very much for watching this, uh, this video and we're one step closer to a passwordless future. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jacobo and I'm a software engineer at Igalia. I've been working on Chrome accessibility for the last couple of years and I've spent several months working on accessible name and description calculation, ACNAME for short. This is an important area in web accessibility. Interactive elements have names which are in turn spoken or brailed by assistive technologies like screen readers. For example, a button with the text new likely has an accessible name of new, but a button with just a bold B might have an author provided accessible name of bold. If an interactive element lacks a meaningful name, it's hard for a user who's blind to make sense of, it pur of its purpose. Name calculation can get quite complex. There are different attributes that affect it, 
it may require recursively looking at descendant elements. Given this complexity, there is a W3C spec, for which you can find the link here. The algorithm in this spec attempts to address the many different ways to name content, establish priorities when multiple and maybe conflicting sources are present, and handle various corner cases that have been discovered over the years. Chrome's implementation of this spec is, not surprisingly, pretty complex too. The logic is spread across 12 functions belonging to different classes, and they call each other creating cycles. It performs different kinds of traversals too, depending on the information we are looking for. So this is what my colleagues and I have achieved so far in the last months. We landed around 300 new tests that help detect corner cases and bugs in our implementation. We filed issues against the spec about things we found unclear. The most discussed one uh, involved name calculation from a hidden subtree. You may know authors can label things out of a hidden node using aria label by, but we found out that every major browser was doing this slightly differently. The discussion is still ongoing. We fixed bugs. The most visible one was uh, about CSS pseudo elements before and after, which were missing from the act name. And finally, and this is the most technically complex task, uh, we streamlined our traversal code to calculate a name from descendants, reusing the accessibility tree instead of doing a new DOM traversal every time. Actually, I'm still working on this, but I hope it's landed by blink on date. This change had a lot of uh, side effects uh, that sometimes exposed the existing bugs that we also fixing. But it is worth the effort because it clears up our code, it's faster and fixes bugs. All this was a lot of work and there are still things to do, but we achieved a lot. Uh, better code, fixed bugs, more test coverage, improvements in the spec, so it was totally worth it. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, we introduced the WebID at last BlinkCon. This time we're going to show you a quick update on this API. It's more than just a name change. And by the way, we changed the name to FancyM. So this project is about federation, which means when you're trying to sign up on the website, instead of using your email and password, you can just continue with an identity provider, such as Apple, Facebook, Google, and others. And why do we think this, in, this is important? Because federation is safer than the precise usernames and passwords due to phishing, password reusing, et cetera. The problem here is, by design, federation was built on top of low-level primitives, such as iframes, uh, I, uh, the party cookies redirect, but by accident, the same primitives can also enable cross-site checking, which is bad. FedCM is a high-level, identity-specific, privacy-preserving browser API that enables Federation to continue thriving on the web post third party cookies application. To learn more, please come to our breakout sessions. In short, this API enables a browser-mediated authentication flow in the user consent moment. For example, when you're trying to sign up on this recipe website, the browser will show this uh, bottom sheet. Depending on which IDP you're using, the bot button may look a little bit different, but with this bottom sheet, user can sign up with that IDP on this website. Quick demo. See, I just moved to Canada. I want to uh, find some apartments in Toronto. So the first one says, okay, fake rental, which looks legitimate to me. So let's get in. So as you can see from, from the top right, it says sign in, which means I'm not. I don't even have an account here. Start to browse. Okay, here, this one looks pretty, pretty good. It looks so warm and you know, it's in Canada. What else are you looking for? So I want to tap the start button to add it to my favorites or watch list. But those kind of actions normally require a account, but I don't have one. So I will be uh, navigated to this page for sign up. FedCM API will show a bottom sheet that allow user to sign up for this big rental with an identity provider with one tab. And after that, the browser work is done and the website will take over because an account has been created. The user will be navigated back to the earlier page or not. As you can see here, we show the username on top right and not surprisingly, the apartment has been started. Cool, so what's the status of this project? Well, it's a year-long project 
Oh, did I say year long? I mean, 10 years. It's like decade long project. So it's very complex. It's very challenging. If you want to learn more, please come to our breakout session so we can discuss in length. Thank you. Hey folks, just wanted to give a quick overview of a project that the Chrome Graphics Metrics and Speed Metric teams are working on, an animation smoothness score for websites. What do I mean by that? Well, measuring something like frame rate for the web is complicated. We all want pages to feel buttery smooth and jank free. But for users, there's just so many simultaneous things happening at once that could lead to poor experience, from slow loading, poor responsiveness, shifting content, you know, sites can feel slow and be clunky in ways that are really unrelated to smoothness. So we want a metric that focuses specifically on animations, including scrolling. At the same time, just measuring animation frames themselves is complicated. Chromium has a threaded architecture with a deeply parallel rendering pipeline, and it optimizes to produce a steady stream of animation frame updates, even if all we have is a partial update. High frame rates, don't necessarily guarantee smoothness, and low frame rates don't necessarily mean the opposite. We need a metric that handles all these nuances and batches up with the way sites feel for users. Roughly speaking, here's how we do it. We start by detecting active animations. We're more sensitive to frame throughput when animations are active. We instrument the rendering pipeline to keep careful account of main thread, compositor thread, and GPU progress. Then for each frame rendering opportunity, we track how much we want it to present versus how much was actually presented to the screen. And then by measuring frames over the lifetime of the page, we can convert into an overall score. We recently published a long form blog post at web.dev smoothness that goes over more of the background and the goals, if you're interested. For now, just know that the metrics in development are for the time being named normalized percent drop frames. And one of the most convenient ways to play with this metric is to use the Chrome HUD, which is available behind a Chrome flag. If you enable the HUD, you'll see three different drop frames scores at the top corner under the Core Web Vitals. Play around with some sites, see how they score. Does it match up with your expectation for how the site feels? Or if you prefer to dive deep into rendering traces, check out Badad's lightning talk on using Chrome tracing and making sense of the rendering pipeline reporter trace events. Finally, if you care about this topic, we're hosting a breakout session at BlinkCon where we'll go over the conditions that affect animation smoothness or the differences between visual completeness, latency, and overall smoothness. We'll brainstorm the best ways to surface this information in lab tooling and the best ways to expose this information as a web platform API. Hope to see you there. Hello. My name is Behdad, and I wanted to talk to you about tracing, focusing on performance and smoothness on behalf of GPU metrics team. One feature that you can try enabling it on Chrome flags right now is to show performance metrics in a heads-on display. And doing so, you will see the core web vitals as well as average drop frame and some other metrics focusing on smoothness. And in this case, I've been scrolling the blink on page, and there has been about 1% of dropped frames. Now, if I want to focus on that drop frame and see why that's been happening and um, learn a bit more about that, I can do a trace of the page and look at that. Going through Chrome tracing and making a trace for rendering, and I'm choosing rendering here because that has most of the tracing categories for frame production, you will see a page like this, which has different processes uh, and has a lot of events, lots of details to go to uh, over a timeline of the interaction with the page. So on the left here, I'm focusing on the render process. And a part of those is the trace events called pipeline reporters, which will summarize all the stages that the frame will go through in the way of being produced. Uh, you will have uh, active interactions. Here I have this wheel scroll uh, highlighted in the tracker validation. And then on top, you will see an alert for drop frames with a corresponding pipeline reporter trace event, which was actually dropped and was the cause of creating that alert. If you want to learn more about why that frame was dropped, you can see what's happening in that reporter and perhaps some reporters before and after at that area. And 
to do so, you need to know what is the details of this pipeline reporter. Uh, the reporter itself will highlight different segments that the frame will go through and uh, color coded to the chart on the left that you can see uh, each part is doing some different work on different processes, as well as some arguments for that pipeline reporter saying what was happening during that frame. Uh, in terms of what uh, active interactions were there, in terms of animation or scroll, and then what was the final state of that frame. In this case, the frame was dropped. Uh, to learn more about the details of tracing and how to use them in performance analysis and understanding smoothness, please join us in the Tracing Frames 101 breakout talk on November 7th. Thank you. Hello there, uh, my name is Mike Taylor, and I'm gonna be talking about the upcoming Chrome 100 release and why that's interesting. Uh, but first off, let's get calibrated on the number 100. So this is 100 hot dogs. This is a print of a cat that's about 100 years old. This is a huge uh, 100 emoji that looks somewhat violent at this resolution, I'm now realizing. Uh, and this is the user agent string for Chrome 100. And it might be problematic. Uh, we don't really know right now. So uh, to understand why, we'll take a tour of what could go wrong uh, with a few examples taken from real bugs uh, reported on real websites. So developers, as you, as you all know, are very creative. And sometimes they do very creative things with string parsing. For example, uh, if you assume that version number offsets are stable, uh, and that versions will always be less than 100. Um, that might get you into trouble. So this code is from a not so popular jQuery plugin, thankfully, uh, that assumes that the offset of substr, or however that's pronounced, is stable. Uh, and hopefully, if it's greater than 100, or greater than 99, rather, uh, it'll tell you that your browser is out of date. Here's another example of doing something very similar where someone is using a hard-coded offset of eight to get the Firefox version number, which will fail because it'll return 10 once Firefox hits 100. So we'll, we'll take a second to absorb this code. And uh, you should be able to see or guess anytime you see strings being compared, uh, that should make you nervous. And you could guess that this will fail in Firefox 100 and eventually even in Safari 100. And the reason is because JavaScript, when it's comparing strings, it does alphanumeric comparison. So you get something wacky like the string 10 is less than the string 2. Um, or some other websites might literally hard code uh, version 99 is the max version for no discernible reason, perhaps job security. So how big a problem is this uh, for us, for Firefox, for Edge, for Opera? We don't actually know right now, uh, but you can help us test by turning on this force major version to 100 flag in Chrome 96 plus. We're also gonna be running some Finch experiments on Canary to see if we can sniff out some bugs at a larger scale um, and decide if we have to do something more dramatic. Um, if you'd like to learn more, you can check out the Chrome Developer blog post that Ali and I co-authored. You can find the link in the slides. Uh, presumably that's linked somewhere useful. And thank you so much. All right, so I'm very excited to see many awesome updates and heartwarming comments in the text chat. Thank you very much, all the speakers. So please send another round of applause to all the speakers. <laughs> so tomorrow, so we will have 12 more lightning talks. So please don't miss it. So see you tomorrow. Thank you so much, Kentaro, and so much to all the presenters who put together those great lightning talks. Those were extremely fast and very exciting. Um, we're gonna have a short break, a couple minutes to stretch your legs, grab a coffee, whatever you need to refresh yourself. And then we're gonna go into the first of the sessions. Uh, again, these are going to be in a separate like spot in your Hopin UI. 
go to the left side and click on the sessions section. We're going to have uh, two session slots, each running two sessions simultaneously, another short break after that, uh, and then the final uh, third session slot following. After all of that, we'll conclude the day with the social event with Jake and Surma. Uh, because we needed a little bit more interactivity out of it than what Hopin can currently provide, that will again be run over Meet. Uh, details are up here on the slide. Uh, if you are following along the official public slides, you can just click the link. Otherwise, you can uh, type it in. This slide will remain up on stage for the next hour and a half uh, through the social event. So feel free to just look at this, type it in manually, or whatever you need to do. So for now, please go ahead and have a nice break. Come back refreshed, and let's enjoy some great sessions. Thank you so much.